Okay, everyone, let's go on to chapter three, which is quality assurance in spirometry testing. So the chapter outline consists of looking at quality assurance, which includes infection prevention, child safety, technician training and mentorship, spirometry data review and technician mentorship, standard operating procedures, equipment maintenance and record keeping. What you'll be able to do at the end of this chapter is define and explain quality assurance in spirometry, describe sources of infection in spirometry and prevent those, outline recommended procedures for good infection control in spirometry. You'll be able to describe how to keep a child safe during spirometry testing, detail and keep records of team training requirements, conduct spirometry data audits and mentor technicians, write a standard operating procedure for pediatric spirometry, maintain the spirometer and accessory equipment, and lastly, keep records of all aspects of your pediatric spirometry testing service. So quality assurance in spirometry refers to all the procedures put in place to reduce variability in spirometry measurements. This includes checks before, during, and after spirometry testing in the environment, in, with the equipment, with the technician, and with the child. So just to be very clear, there are two different terms that people often confuse. The one is quality assurance and the other one is quality control. Quality control refers specifically to equipment checks and is part of quality assurance. So it is one aspect of quality assurance, whereas quality control procedures must be applied on a routine basis. The section that we're looking at now, chapter three, covers everything to do with quality assurance and quality control is covered in chapter four. So the first thing in terms of quality assurance is preventing infection in spirometry. So the goal of infection prevention is to prevent the transmission of infection to children and staff during pulmonary function testing. The number of documented cases of infection transmission in spirometry is small, but the potential is there, it's real. So, Elaborate precautions are not justified for most children, and a practical approach to infection prevention is best, especially in the COVID era. We have to be very careful that we know that cross-infection can take place directly from surface areas, from the mouthpieces, the nose clips, with the holding of the spirometer itself, and then indirectly as well through aerosol droplets when blowing. So infection control procedures in spirometry need to be practical and sensible. They need to be evidence-based, cost-effective. They need to be within the control of substances hazardous to health. So what that means is that we've got to be careful what substances we use to clean our spirometers and our, our surface areas, our hands, things like that. Infection control procedures must be made in consultation with the whole staff complement of everyone who's working on spirometry. They must be adaptable and they must be documented. Let's start with cleaning the spirometer. How you clean your spirometer depends on what the manufacturer says. So every spirometer is a little bit different, but how frequently you use it, how easy it is to disassemble and reassemble, all of those are important aspects when cleaning your spirometer. So the cleaning procedure itself, the spirometer must be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected after each use. So before each new child is tested, with cleaning and disinfection wipes that comply with EN 1276 that are intended for use on plastic items. So what that is saying is don't use anything that is going to damage the casing of the spirometer, which is usually made of one or another type of plastic. So when cleaning the spirometer, use an antibacterial wipe to clean the outside of the main body handle and flow tube. Ensure during cleaning that no liquid enters any holes in the tube itself and the handle. Use disposable mouthpieces, must be disposed of into biohazardous waste after they've been used. And when cleaning the device, avoid bending or twisting the cables because that can cause a damage to the cables eventually and ultimately the demise of your spirometer. If there are any permanent sharp cracks or bends or holds in the spirometry cables that are visible, contact the manufacturer to replace that because if you clean that and it gets into the electrics, you could have a problem there. 
Depending on the type of equipment you use daily, you might need to remove the spirometer flow tube and clean according to the manufacturer's instructions. So in other words, you could, for example, soak the head in Milton or a similar bleach solution as per the manufacturer's instructions. Shake the solution out, dry, spray, wipe with EN1276 compliant wipes or solutions. And make sure that no liquid is blocking any of the small tubes inside of the spirometer. But don't get confused with this. Most spirometers, you cannot immerse them in water. So please read your manufacturer's instructions very, very carefully. Notes on in terms of cleaning, never use acetone-based cleaning products when cleaning the spirometer. Never use reuse disposable mouthpieces. Mouthpieces are cheap and any perceived cost savings will not outweigh the risks to the device and more importantly, the child. The disposable mouthpieces are classified as waste and should be disposed of in accordance with the applicable regulations. All right, measures for promoting good hygiene and preventing cross infection. Since spirometry creates significant amounts of droplets and aerosols, steps must be taken to minimize the risk of infection to patients and staff during testing. Technicians need to be concerned about their patients and staff and for the community and family members with whom staff and patients have contact. So let's look at what the technician can do to promote good hygiene and prevent cross infection. So firstly, the technician must be certified as a competent pediatric spirometry technician. They should do a pre-spirometry infection risk screening questionnaire, which can be found at the end of this chapter for COVID, to elicit any history of exposure to COVID-19 within the past two weeks prior to the test taking place. This questionnaire also helps to look and see if they are exhibiting any COVID-19 symptoms, if they have traveled to high-risk areas, if there are any positives on this screening questionnaire, the spirometry test should not be performed and should be rescheduled. Passing the pre-screening test does not indicate that a patient is not infected. The patient may be infected but may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and still able to affect others. And we need to bear this in mind when we think about the infection prevention measures we take when testing. Importantly, the technician should avoid testing children who have other active respiratory infections like TB or even a common cold or the flu. Personal protective equipment consisting of a plastic apron, gloves, a face mask and a face shield or eye shield should be worn during testing and should be discarded after each child has been tested. Hand washing before and after administering a spirometry test is essential for good infection prevention. Keep a distance between the technician and the patient and ensure that the patient blows right away from the technician, not onto the equipment and not onto the technician. Other members of staff should not move in and out of the testing room while testing. There should be a limited amount of staff left in the testing room. Dispose of all mouthpieces into biohazardous waste bags and keep a log of all people entering the spirometry room. The child and the caregiver, what can they do to prevent infection? First of all, only the child and the technician should be present in the testing room. If the child is really small and needs the parent or caregiver with them, then just the caregiver should stay with the child. The child should wear a mask before and after testing and in between blows, and the caregiver or patient should wear their mask throughout. The environment for testing should be a well-lit and well-ventilated room. So there should be negative pressure, air flows from clean to potentially contaminated areas. Preferably, the room should be used only for spirometry testing. Testing in some instances may be conducted outdoors if there is protection from wind that might affect baseline flow measurements just before the child starts to blow. So what you'll learn as we go along is that it's very, very important that in those few moments before the blow, that the spirometer is able to set a zero baseline for flow. So in other words, it measures no flow of air before the child starts to blow on the machine. If there is some flow of air due to a fan or a little bit of wind, the machine is not going to read the baseline properly, which means that it will not cut off the test correctly when the flow of air from the patient slows down significantly to indicate the end of test. 
Scheduling, you should leave adequate time between tests for disinfection of equipment and all the surface areas between patients. This will also allow time to let any aerosolized particles settle out. So ideally leave at least a 15 minute break between patients in which time you can wipe clean the active surfaces and the equipment itself between the patients. When it comes to disposables, add a single usable disposable with a high efficiency inline bacterial filter for each new patient and discard that filter after the test into the biohazardous waste. You could use disposable nose clips or let the patient hold his or her nose himself. Provide children with tissues and instructions on covering their nose and mouth when coughing or sneezing. During the procedure itself, just prior to conducting the FEC procedure to protect the child from inhaling any airborne particles, the child should put the mouthpiece in the mouth and inhale through the filter rather than inhaling room air before they put their mouth onto the mouthpiece, before blasting the air out so that all the particles in the air are contained in the spirometer with the filter on it rather than being escaped and available in the environment itself. Allow the child to remove his own mouthpiece after testing. So once the mouth has touched the mouthpiece, then you do not touch it again. Ask the child to then take the mouthpiece off and the filter off if necessary and throw them into the biohazardous waste. Bacterial filters should be mandatory in the period post-COVID. Bacterial filters are known to be 99% effective, and this, as I say, is especially important in the era of COVID. COVID-19 precautions suggest that the equipment should be wiped down between patients. A planned equipment maintenance program is essential in terms of quality assurance and spirometry. This program needs to be overseen and managed by the lead of the spirometry service. Some of the things that you would do to maintain your equipment are as follows. You would do a visual inspection of the spirometer and accessories. So if the spirometer, for example, has been dropped, you may see a crack in the housing of the spirometer. You'll be able to see if there's any damage, any cracks, any sort of chips out of the spirometer, things like that. You need to conduct at least a daily linearity calibration check, which you'll learn about in the next chapter. You could do biological control on the spirometer, which is when you use a healthy, normal person to blow onto the machine on a regular basis and make sure that there's almost exactly the same results are read every single time that biological control blows, that same person blows. You need to clean your equipment according to manufacturer's instructions and you need to contact the manufacturers periodically for software upgrades and for servicing depending on the type of spirometer you have. So to maintain your spirometer correctly, it is important to understand the measuring and operating principles of each of the devices. The spirometrist should always ensure the child's safety. So this includes ensuring that the physical environment is safe. For example, if the child does a spirometry standing, that he or she has a chair behind them, that if they feel a little bit faint, they can sit back down into the chair without causing any damage. Infection prevention processes must have been carried out and contraindications checked before every testing session and especially when administering medications for bronchodilated responsiveness testing. When doing audits of your spirometry data, so spirometry data reviews, it's essential that we are gathering high quality spirometry tests because if we don't have high quality spirometry tests, our interpretation and classification of the child's respiratory health is going to be incorrect. So if the interpreter concludes that spirometry results are not reliable, the child may need to be retested and the effectiveness of the entire child monitoring program could be called into question if there's too many suboptimally conducted tests. So facilities conducting pediatric spirometry tests should establish ongoing programs of regular quality assurance reviews of spirograms and calibration reports to ensure that the quality, the overall quality of the testing service is very, very high. Quality assurance reviews must be conducted by people who are experienced in recognizing and correcting flawed spirometry test results such as the service lead or an external third party 
who is a spirometry specialist, randomly selected spirometry test reports and all invalid tests, and a sampling of tests with unusually low or unusually high results, for example, FECs and FEV1s well over um, the lower level of normal or well over 130% of predicted should be examined. Though electronic tracings and records are evaluated most efficiently, hard copy reports can also be reviewed. Reviews should be performed at least quarterly and more often if the technician is inexperienced or if poor technical quality is observed. Reports on test session quality should be prepared monthly or at least quarterly for every technician. So after the quality assurance review, the feedback to the technician should focus on evaluating his or her coaching skills and understanding the elements of a valid spirometry test. So the technician must also be allowed to speak and to give feedback to the quality assurance reviewer. So periodic discussions between the technician and reviewer should include things such as the frequency and type of technical errors causing unacceptable curves and the frequency of non-repeatable tests. So what you find is that if there's a misunderstanding, if one of the staff members is misunderstanding one aspect of spirometry, you may find the same error repeating itself again and again and again in this person's tests, naturally. So therefore, it's a really perfect time to point out particular errors that there might be and to correct those errors during this spirometry data review assessment. Coaching actions that the technician can take to improve the child's test quality, and then always try and give positive feedback for good performance. Comments regarding spirometer configuration and settings and formatting of the reports is also important, and to check on those things when you are doing the quality assurance review. And feedback from the technician about what can be done to improve the spirometry results. So, for example, you know, the technician might have a good idea. They might say, let's provide these kids with some age-appropriate educational materials or perhaps um, let's maintain the equipment in a different way or store the equipment in a different way. So both the quality assurance reviewer and the technician should be able to put their best ideas forward to review the data and to improve the quality of the data all the time. The goal is to ensure that at least 80% of spirometry tests are technically valid. So supervision or retraining of a pediatric spirometry technician is indicated when the overall spirometry test quality falls below an 80% success rate. The importance of a quality control program that continuously monitors individual technician performance and with feedback to the technicians in obtaining adequate pediatric spirometry results is critical to the collection of high quality data. The central document in any good spirometry testing program is a written spirometry procedure manual. Such a manual makes pediatric spirometry testing procedures and equipment calibration information readily available and ensures that everyone in the workplace is applying the same standardized procedures to everything they do when it comes to spirometry. This standard operating procedure should be available to all the staff and to, to contract staff, and the manual should also be used to help train new staff who are coming in and learning about spirometry. So some of the things that you would put into a standard operating procedure include these. How you would conduct an equipment and calibration check procedure how often you should do it. Detailed descriptions of the pediatric spirometry testing procedure. Criteria for test validity, that is acceptability, usability, and repeatability. So remember that validity is another word for acceptability, usability, and repeatability. Acceptability, usability, and repeatability are part of the data validity criteria. We need to mention what the reference values will be in that workplace against which the child's blow is looked at. We need protocols to establish and to prevent infection. So we need to know about correct sensor decontamination, how to look for zero flow errors in case there's a little bit of moisture on the spirometer itself before the patient blows, and all the actions that you need to take to prevent flawed values from being 
kept on record. You need required training for personnel involved in pediatric spirometry testing. The bare minimum is a certificate of competence in foundational pediatric testing with refresher updates every three to five years. You need a protocol for quality assurance reviews. The standard operating procedure should also include actual spirometry infection risk questionnaire and the spirometry contraindications risk questionnaires readily available as appendices at the end of the document. Sample calibration and spirometry test reports could be in the standard operating procedure. The manufacturer's spirometer user manual and contact information for the manufacturer or the local distributor of that spirometer should be readily available in that standard operating procedure as well. You need to have a list of necessary supplies and where you would get those from. There could be instructions for infection control procedures, including cleaning and sterilizing the spirometer. The date and file name for the current version of the procedure manual should be clearly indicated and updates should also be looked at from time to time, usually annually. So when it comes to technician training, we want all the technicians to be trained and to have a certificate of competence in spirometry. So we want them to undergo refresher spirometry and they can from time to time take micro learning or bite-sized bits of spirometry training to keep their skills and their interest in the subject up. So for older children aged 12 to 16 years, healthcare professionals competent at testing adults would be deemed competent to perform the tests. But healthcare professionals performing spirometry in younger children aged between, say, 5 and 12 years must have appropriate experience and training in pediatric spirometry. And this includes the use of incentive spirometry, which is where the child can look at pictures that, that help them to blow faster and harder than they normally would, like blowing out candles um, and such like. In terms of record keeping, adequate record keeping is a critical component of any good spirometry program. So to improve the quality of the spirometry testing program, there are three important record keeping components. That is keeping your spirometry test reports, that's the first one. Secondly, keeping records of your equipment maintenance, and that would include calibration and biological calibration test reports. And then lastly, keeping records of the personal training and evaluation records. So just let's look a little bit deeper at spirometry test reports. So every spirometry test report should include the test date and time, the child's name, ID number, age, height, sex, and race. The type of spirometer used. So technically somewhere on the report, you might be able to see the serial number of that spirometer as well ambient air or spirometer temperature and barometric pressure. You need to know what test posture was used. Was the patient seated or was the patient standing? Because if they choose seated, they must always be seated. If you choose standing, that child should always be done standing. Sources of reference values used for lower levels of normal and predicted values. We need to know that spirometry test report needs to tell us the results of the three best curves. So it's not good enough to just see the best data. We want to see data from the best three tests done at least, so that we can look at every test for acceptability and repeatability, and look at the measurements one to the other. We want three almost perfectly identical spirometry measurements. It would be great to see the technician's name and initials. We would also like to see the technician comments on child cooperation, effort and other aspects of the testing session. Flow volume and volume time curves should be saved for all the tests. How you measure repeatability should be showing up as well on the test reports, or it could have a comment on repeatability somewhere on the test report. And very importantly, we want to know when the machine was checked, when a calibration check was conducted on the equipment before the child started to blow. The second aspect of record keeping would be to do with equipment maintenance records. So since equipment maintenance records support the accuracy of the spirometry test result in the medical record, the equipment record should be saved, as I'm going to tell you shortly, and the availability of such records permits later troubleshooting of problematic spirometry test results, 
which is particularly important when conducting periodic spirometry testing. Equipment maintenance records for each spirometer should include the following. At least a quality control log, which records calibration checks, routine maintenance, upgrades, repairs performed, and the results, the date, the time of each procedure, the technician's name who conducted that procedure, and some spirometry systems will store this information very easily for you in a database. Reports generated during calibration checks need to be saved almost indefinitely. So you're going to keep the calibration records as long as you would keep the spirometry records. And the time frame for that would differ depending on your workplace. The model, serial number and identification number of the spirometer and the dates and versions of the computer software and hardware updates or changes should be recorded somewhere. Store the manufacturer's manuals, warranties, etc. with the quality control log. Good. So keeping equipment maintenance records is important. We want to be able to go back to them and verify that the machine was in good working order before that child actually blew onto the spirometer itself. Personal training and evaluation records. Personal qualifications should be documented and available for review. So personnel training and evaluation records need to include records of technician, continuing education, and results of evaluation and feedback to the technician. So in other words, you're keeping records of all the training that they've had, including little bite-sized education sessions, and you're keeping records of their certificates or any comments with regards to the training. And then, of course, keeping the certificates from completed and approved spirometry training courses. Lastly, in terms of record keeping, the third aspect is personnel training and evaluation records. So every calibration and spirometry result must be stored in such a way that retrieval of a child's results is possible and uncomplicated. Mostly this is done digitally. So for any spirometers that do not have functionality to upload the results to a computer, paper copies must be kept. If the result of that paper copy is on thermal paper, we know that the results on thermal paper fade over time. So you would then, at the time of the test, you would need to photocopy the result on the thermal paper and then save the original with the photocopy so that that test report can be looked at at any date in the future and you're not relying on a thermal copy which will have faded over a few years. All right, so that brings us to the end of chapter three and we now go on to equipment quality control in chapter four.